Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Sam's Healing Podcast. As always, my name is Sam, but today I'm joined by, in my opinion, a hero of recovery work and empathy and kindness. If you've had any time on social media, you have probably seen Dr. Jake Porter. And man, Jake, I'm honored that you would come in and do a podcast with me. So thank you for coming in. Well, that was quite the introduction. I think you made me blush. And uh, (laughs) now that we've set that bar really high, uh, you know, put me up on that pedestal. I can I can fall all the way down. (laughs) Anybody that's familiar with your social media, I think, would give credence to the fact that there's a kindness from you. Mm. There's an empathy from you that is Mm. uncanny. That is something that. You know, they even have a term, right? Therapist induced trauma. So many of us, self included, have been hurt by professionals who maybe they had so many letters behind their name, but they didn't have empathy. They didn't have kindness. They didn't have a sense of, hey, I've been there. And so with with my little following and people that are, you know, getting reacquainted with my videos and podcasts, I thought it would be good. You have a ton of letters behind your name. I'll let you kind of share what those are, but maybe for my audience, the viewing and the listening audience, why don't you share a little bit about who you are, what you do, all of the certifications and all that fun stuff. Well, uh, Sam, you made me tear up there because kindness is, um, it's one of my core values. And that is, that is definitely how I want to be known. Um, because I've been shown a lot of kindness and I have needed a lot yes. of kindness. Yes. And, um, you know, I, uh, b- before we get into any of those letters behind my name, I, I will say I, I have been there. I am in recovery myself. I've been in recovery for about 15 years. Um, it has not been a perfect recovery. I have a long history uh, where I can look back and s- just see a lot of a lot of destruction from from decisions and choices and uh, consequences and um, and and yet now I get to do this work and yeah. find some redemption of of the pain and right. um, that's that's the most important thing uh, about me I think that I would want people to know. I think it's evident in just your demeanor. I remember when I found you quite some time ago, and I was like, man. This dude has a spirit about him and and you know it when you hear it mm. and you know it when you don't hear it. <laughs> sure. I remember not too recent. I mean, not too long ago, I was talking to a guy. If I said his name, he's probably one of the most prolific pastors in the nation, not because of his infidelity, but because of someone close to him. And he talked with me and I was like, who is this guy that just said to me, Sam, I don't know what we're doing, but you know better than I do. So help me. And I thought the humility Uh, was ridiculous. Then I talked to a guy a while ago of an organization that has long since kind of folded. And let me tell you, I was like, I can't get off the phone fast enough. This guy makes me want to throw (laughs) up. And this guy reminds me of how I was before recovery. So yeah, there's some parallels there. So Tell everybody, I know that you're in Houston, but share a little bit about your organization yeah. and, and what sure. you do. Sure. So um, I started in 2017 a practice called Daring Ventures Counseling, Coaching, and Consulting. And we do specialize in working with trauma and addiction, primarily process addictions, primarily sex and pornography, though we also do gambling and some other stuff as well. And uh, we grew very, very quickly and um, got about 20 folks on the team now. We see people from all over the world, you know, Israel and Denmark and, you know, uh, but all over the country. And um, and so because of that and because my licensure only allows me to practice inside Texas, that means I do intensives. So I don't uh, take on any new clients anymore for ongoing kind of regular weekly, biweekly work. Now, if you see me, you're going to see me for about six hours a day for two or three or four days in a row. You're going to be sick of me when you're done. Uh, but, but it's a really, uh, fun way to operate. <laughs> People are like fun, but, but it is. Cause you think about, you think about the standard 50 minute therapy session, right? 
And by the time you catch up on the week and, you know, kind of yeah. get into it and then have to start wrapping things up, closing things up before you're, you're sent on your way. What do you do? Like 20, 25 minutes of actual work, maybe. Right. Um, but yeah, when I'm with one couple for six hours in one day, we can go deep. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's awesome. I love, I, I love the work that I get to do. Yeah. yeah. And it's evident because when I hear you speak, when I've watched you and some of the videos of your intensives, there's, I never hear from you. You just need to get over it. You just need to deal with it. Whenever start somebody starts with, you just need to, I go, <laughs> oh God, oh God, Here help go. us. What's, what's coming next, right? Yeah. And so today, you know, I want to stay in your wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest giftings I think is your compassion for people who are actively grieving. And I haven't published this video yet, but I'm working on a video that I did about, it would be so nice if we could go to grief Island, oh, just yeah. disappear, not have to work, raise kids, be with our yeah. partner. We could just go sit on this Island and grieve, drink, grieving drinks, have a mm. grieving sunset, <laughs> grieving meals, but it doesn't work that way. We have no. to go through life while we're grieving. But if I titled this podcast Dealing with Grief, the numbers would be ridiculous because people yeah. don't want to talk about it. We hate it. We despise grief. Someone this morning in one of my coaching sessions said, Sam, I know that you say I have to do this, but I hate this. And I hate you for telling me that I have to do <laughs> this. This sucks. But would you agree with the statement that? If we don't grieve, that trauma, that pain is going to come out sideways. It's going to come out somewhere. It's going to cause yeah. us yeah. to make decisions that we really don't want to do. I mean, do you think that's fair? I do think that's fair. And and my analogy would be, you know, if you if you break a bone, guess what? It's going to heal. Yeah. But you want it to heal right. You know, Ooh. you want to set the bone. You want it. You may have to. There may need to be a, a surgery um, to to get it right and in a position to heal in a way that's going to allow you know optimal movement and optimal use and flourishing and 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 health and and all of that. And and <clears throat> our brains as humans, we are we are wired for story. You know, you give me you give me four data points. I'm going to I'm going to connect them with a narrative. I'm going to fill in those gaps with story. And and what that is, if you want to go like a layer deeper, that's that's the concept of meaning. We, right. we make meaning of things. What does it mean that this has happened to me? What does it right. mean that I live in this world, that that this is now the reality of my marriage or or whatever it is? And your brain is going to make meaning. Yeah. That's grief. The The difference is going to be, am I going to allow everything else in this world uh, externally and internally, my past, my traumas, my limiting beliefs, the cognitive distortions that are there, the defense mechanisms that are there, plus, plus all the external threats. Am I going to allow that to just kind of let me drift towards some meaning or am I going to do the work of meaning making on purpose? Well, okay. So you only waited a few minutes to drop a nuclear bomb. So <laughs> doing, doing the work of cre So what does that look like? Cause I think that's a brilliant statement, but how does that play out for the person that's sitting here going my life that I once knew it, is nothing like it used to be. Maybe you created the trauma because of your unfaithfulness or addiction. Maybe you're the betrayed trying to make sense out of this life that you didn't ask for. You didn't oh, sign yeah. up for. you didn't want, you didn't deserve. And then yeah. we sit here going, or maybe we're a childhood sexual abuse survivor who's just coming into an awareness of, wait a minute, like I sat on this for decades. Right. And so to the people that are trying to see how does that play out? What does that look like? Yeah. Yeah. So it it starts with having both feet firmly mm. planted in reality. You know, I see uh, a lot of times the the one who committed the betrayal, uh, who maybe is coming out of those those behaviors, those those addictions, whatever it is, they want to move forward. They're like, 
you know, let's, let's keep going forward. Let's yeah. keep looking ahead. I'm not doing that anymore, but, yeah. but they're not, they're not taking the time to go back and, and look at what happened. Or if it's the betrayed partner, there, there's a lot of ways that, that they can get tangled up in this. Sometimes they don't want to look at it because they're just trying to keep their family together, right? They're just right. trying to keep their, their kids protected from uh, the fallout or they're, you know, they're just trying to survive, you know, uh, a situation that seems to them impossible financially, relationally, you know, uh, professionally, whatever. Um, or it could be, they don't want to look at it because they just know it's not fair, right. which is true, which is absolutely true. But because they know it's not fair. They they refuse to accept that this this is my reality. Um, M. Scott Peck, who wrote The Road Less Traveled, one of my favorite quotes is, is him writing, mental health is an ongoing process of dedication to reality at all costs. Yeah. So so that meaning making process starts with what is my reality? I've got to sit in it, I've got to look at it, I've got to let myself feel it. Right. Yeah. We don't, we know we live in a society. I mean, we don't need to pontificate. It's a, it's a fact. We live in a society. Nobody likes to feel anymore. Right. Or sure. we want to escape. We want to yeah. medicate. We want to try and just avoid at all costs. And, you know, there's the five stages of grief. And I forget the gentleman's name that wrote a book on the sixth stage of grief, mm. which was meaning, finding meaning, and so I guess a, a question for you, you deal with this every day like I do, and sometimes so much. Um, to the person that is sitting here going, look, my life is in shambles. You know, Dr. Porter, I appreciate this meaning and all of this, but in your practice, in those that you coach and, and oversee, I mean, is it I'm I'm teeing this up for you because people get sick of hearing it from me. But the fact is, okay. <laughs> people can find new life. People can oh. heal from addiction and betrayal, right? People kind of look at me a, not a lot nowadays with, I'm trying, Sam. I'm trying to believe that it's going to get easier and it's going to get better. But what's your take on it? Because we do work with people that some of our work is like, dear God, I'm just trying to make it through today. I'm just trying to find hope. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Well, I, I 100% believe that healing is possible. And I believe it's possible on both sides. I believe that because I've experienced it personally. Mm -hmm. I believe that um, because I've seen it professionally. You know, I can I can put on my my academic hat as a as a researcher uh, and see it there. Um, but I can I can put on my friend hat and, and the loved ones I have who have gone through and are going through this. And, uh, you know, I think often what happens if I if I were to like I'm trying to think of it like, OK, I'm at a standing desk right now. If I were lowering right. this thing and somehow my thumb got smashed in the in the lowering mechanism. The pain that I'm actually kind of feeling in my back right now, because my trainer pushed me kind of hard this morning at the gym, I wouldn't be feeling that anymore. Right. Or the fact that it's a little it's a little bit warm in here today uh, and I can kind of feel it on my neck. I wouldn't be because my thumb would be throbbing so much. All of right. my attention would be on my thumb. And that would be like my whole universe for a little bit. And and that's, I think that's the position that sometimes people are in when they don't see a way out, when they don't see hope and healing as a possibility. They're, they've got the smashed thumb. And what happens in the brain is it's like all attention goes right there to the trauma, right, right. there to the wound. And that consumes our view. But but that does, just because that's all we can see or feel in the moment doesn't mean that's all there is. Yeah. I think it's a beautiful picture. I think, you know, for us unfaithful, we find ourselves feeling like, man, I'm kind of happy. The addiction is I, I'm really living in the light as some that come from faith yeah. would say, or, Hey, I'm, I've got 300 days of, of sobriety and the unfaithful's like, man, I feel so hopeful. Hmm. And then the betrayed, male or female, is like, hey, 
I'm glad you're feeling good. I'm over here <laughs> trying to pick myself yeah. up out of the bed. I'm over here trying to survive while I'm raising kids, while I'm going to a job, while I'm trying to pay my bills. So for an unfaithful that's sitting here going, how do I help my betrayed? Because one of the big complaints I've heard recently in my own coaching is, hey, I did this. I got to go fix it. And I help the unfaithful. Uh, there's no fix in this, buddy. You'll never be able to make up for this, but you can walk beside them. You can help them. You can model healing. But I'm curious, what do you tell the unfaithful who feels so helpless with the grief of the betrayed, the sad, the palatable life changing trauma that the betrayed has had to absorb? How do you help the unfaithful? be safe for them, work for them. What do you, what do you teach them on? Yeah. Well, I would echo exactly what you said just a moment ago. That is exactly where I would start that you can't heal her or him, right? Cause we know right. it goes both ways, gender wise, but you can't heal this person you betrayed. You can, you can help to create um, an atmosphere that is more conducive for healing, you right. might be blessed enough to um, be utilized in a healing process, but you are not going to be the one that does the healing work. And there's actually this odd uh, sort of paradoxical experience that happens with, okay, I'm going to surrender. I'm going to give up the idea that I could be the hero here. Mm. I'm going to give up the idea that I can fix this. And somehow when I accept the reality that I can't, that, that this is a wound that I can't, I can't heal. Th there's a freedom that opens up and often, not all the time, often there's a safety that that creates for, for the one who's been betrayed because right. there's permission now for them to just be, in their pain, be raw in their anger, be be there in their grief, and the the uh, the the person who did the betraying isn't getting triggered with shame, like they're failing in healing the partner. I mean that right. and that we could we could unpack that forever. There is one other thing I do want to say though uh, to answer this question: What can you do? And I could I could mount a soapbox here. I'm going to try really hard not to do it. Do but, it. <laughs> well, so. If you look at the history of this field, you've got you got Patrick Carnes back in the early 80s starting to talk about this. He goes on the Donahue show. He's laugh, you know, they laugh in his face. And look, yep. Car Car Dr. Carnes isn't perfect, but no. he was out there as a pioneer, right? And and so this this field itself is really 40 something years old. Okay. Right. It wasn't until the mid 2000s, 06, 07, that Barbara Steffens does her doctoral research and begins to reconceptualize of the experience of betrayal as trauma rather than right. evidence of codependency that now we're talking less than 20 years ago okay so there are piles and mountains of resources there are lists dozens of names long of places for recovering addicts or those who committed the betrayal to go and get help it's growing and I'm grateful for it, but there's not as much out there for betrayed partners, but that's changing. And, and right. I, I don't mean to turn this into a commercial, but like we just started a program for, for betrayed partners that is of equal clinical um, uh, underpinning to anything offered out there for, for addicts. Um, right. There's another one that's about to be started. I, I don't even know if I can announce it publicly yet, but by by a net, by some colleagues that I'm super excited about. I trust their work. And here's what I want to say. Uh, all right, dude, suit up, show up, work the extra hours, take the second job and send that traumatized partner to treatment. Okay. So I would like you to say that again, work that second job. Like to me, Sometimes I have to say, I told a guy the other night, I said, you know, you could drive for Uber Eats just to pay for your coaching or therapy fund. And he was yep. appalled. Yep. I'm going to be <laughs> missing time with my kids. I said, bro, I get it. Have you considered the possibility that the impact of your trauma 
requires you to maybe get a second job. And he said, when you put it that way, Sam, but <laughs> you're exact, isn't it? There's, there's, you said something. I, I love that you are so kind and said, you know, you can work better to create an atmosphere conducive to healing. <laughs> Sam's, Sam's coaching. I would say, bro, stop being stupid. How bad do yeah. you want it? So that's right. Uh, joking, of course, but you know, at no, the end that, of the day, yeah. isn't, I'm sorry, isn't there this, doesn't there have to be a mentality that says, how bad do you want this healing? Oh yeah, absolutely. Are you all in? Now, now here's what I want to say, because I've, I've used that phrase and I've gotten some really healthy, kind pushback from colleagues about using the phrase all in. Yes, everybody has limits. Of course. Okay. Of course. A am I, am I admittedly using some hyperbole here? Absolutely. I am. Okay. Right. With that disclaimer, are, are you all in? Is it worth right. it? You know, if, if my wife, God forbid, were diagnosed with cancer. And I needed to drive for Uber Eats in the evenings or, or you know, or substitute teach or, you know, whatever it, I mean, I could, exactly. I, whatever it is, Absolutely. you know, make, make pizzas. Um, the heart, it's the heart behind it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do right. it. But why, you know, I'm going to do it if it's cancer. But let me, let me tell you something. Trauma is real. This is a real um disability in which the the brain is actively all tangled up right but it can be healed absolutely it absolutely can one of my final questions for you is you know i think for the work that you do you help the betrays you help the unfaithfuls for the betrayed that's feeling like look this this is unfair the sense of injustice of me. I didn't ask for this. I didn't deserve it, yeah. Sam. I shouldn't, yeah. I shouldn't be here. I've asked a lot of clinicians over the years, and and I'm curious for your take, because I, I know the spirit in which you operate. I know the demeanor in which you handle people, which is so loving. How do you help those that might be listening or watching going, man, all this sounds great. Dr. Porter, I appreciate your kindness and Sam, your humor and snide sarcasm is well placed. But <laughs> I'm sitting here going, this is unfair. This is injustice. Yeah. I don't deserve this. How, what do you say to that betrayed? How do you help them heal and make, how do you help them find the meaning that you spoke of just a few minutes ago? Right. Right. So, and, and I've had that conversation with, with partners sitting right here, right behind me in this Absolutely. chair. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. Um, Many times, many times. And and here's what I, I often say is something like this. If you if you want to wait until the scales of justice are perfectly balanced before you engage in whatever work of healing only you can do for you, that is a choice you can make. But I fear you will be waiting a very long time. And, and I might also just ask, okay, how long have you been waiting for it to be fair? Six months, right. 18 months, three years, 10 years. Is that getting you what you want and need? Yeah. Because if it's not, if it's not serving you, if this strategy of waiting for justice is not serving you well, maybe it's time to consider a different strategy. Yeah, Rick Reynolds, uh, who is a mm -hmm. great friend of mine, and I worked for him for several years, would always yeah. use the expression, I would like you to consider the possibility that perhaps <laughs> right. you are not seeing this clearly. And I think we have the task of helping those who are going through what you very uh, well use. Uh, the word escapes me, but you basically compressed it all with a little bit of a history lesson on trauma and the fact that when you're dealing with betrayal trauma, these little uh, little memes, little kind of cavalier statements, trauma eats those for lunch. 
Uh, mm. Those little yes. one off little statements, trauma, just like a wood chipper, just eats those and says, yeah, give me something else while I just consume that and tell you that means nothing to me. I'm dealing right. with pain that you can't even fathom. And as we're about to say goodbye, for those that are hurting, I mean, you're on the front lines, as am I and so many other clinicians. You're helping people, uh, obviously, albeit in intensives now, but you've you've got so much time spent helping people who are suicidal, who are hopeless, who feel so disillusioned because infidelity, addiction, childhood sexual abuse, I mean, trauma as a whole is so disorienting. It can it can bring about such a sense of disillusionment that I know that people are looking for hope and people are looking for meaning like you you so well described. People are looking for a reason to keep going. I mean, if you were to take just a couple of minutes to encourage those that are sitting here going, man, what do I do? How do what? What's the secret? Is there a magic bullet, Dr. Porter? Is there something that that you would leave people with? Because yeah. I'm hopeful that people will continue to find you for my little audience and, and mm. look at your social media and the stuff that you provide. But for those that are just like, man, I'm trying I'm trying to get on my two feet. How do you encourage them today? Yeah. Yeah. So um, there, there's piles of research to support what I'm about to suggest, okay? Because okay. it could sound a little too good to be true. It's not a magic bullet. I don't, I don't do magic bullets, okay? Um, but, but this can sound too good to be true. Okay. Trauma has the effect of appearing to remove choices, mm. okay? It, it, especially about when and where we and how we think about the trauma because you know intrusive symptoms and avoidance symptoms and you know like these things that are are outside of our control and and it feels so out of control that we feel like we have no control right but what we know from psychological first aid is the first thing we want to do with someone who's experienced trauma is help them start to make choices yeah hey would you rather sit in the in the car or out here on the curb, mm. you know, when, when a couple comes in my office, if, especially if it's super early for that betrayed partner, I look at her and I say, where would you like to sit yeah. here or here, you know, or what, but, you know, and, and here's why this is important because if you're out there and, and you're that person that Sam was just talking about and you're, you're feeling hopeless and you're feeling stuck and you're feeling, you know, all of those things. It might be because you don't have choices you like, right? right? Like you look at the the thing, what you want, you know, you know what you want, you know what you desire, but it, it, there's a gap between where you are and, and that desired end and it feels impossible. But here's how you, if you're in a place where you don't like the choices you have, the way you get to a place where you do like the choices you have is you act on the choices you do have. Yeah, that's great. So start with the choices you do have and yeah. you will begin to expand your, your realm of empowerment. And that's part of the healing from the trauma. And then you can move yourself to that place you want to be. I think you're absolutely right. It's, it speaks to empowering yourself in a way that says you have options. You, yes. you have choices to make. You don't have to lie down and die. This is not the end this is not the sun setting on your life and your future. So I thought I thought that was just such a beautiful, but yet pointed charge for us to really get on our own two feet and start to heal. Yeah. So, man, I just I just love today. I love you. I've enjoyed your content for so long. I'm thrilled mm -hmm. that you would take time out. So to the listener, to the viewer, how do they find you? How do they learn more about your organization? How do they inquire about intensives and all the wonderful yeah. help that you can provide. So uh, on all the social medias, at least all the ones that I'm on. Um, uh, so Facebook, Instagram, apparently I have a TikTok channel and YouTube. I love I'm, it. <laughs> I, yeah, I love I really the humility. Don't. 
I love I, the humility I, that you're like all that social media stuff that I'm on. You're not sitting here going, well, I've, I just, I just want to applaud the humility oh, and the grace. Well, so keep, keep going. But before I interrupted your social media. <laughs> well, um, Dr. Jake Porter is the, is the handle. So, uh, cool. at Dr. Jake Porter on all of those Instagram, uh, not Twitter, uh, but Facebook and TikTok and YouTube. And, and I'll say that our YouTube channel, um, has tons like hours and hours and hours of free resources and that's a great place for people to go um and then if if someone's interested in our intensives they could go to daringventures.com slash intensives there's a free webinar there where i talk about our intensive process or daringventures.com slash couple centered recovery is is actually the model i created for putting the relationship at the center of the recovery process and there's a free webinar there as well on that. So lots of free stuff out there for anyone looking for it. Well, man, I, I hope you'll come in again. This was fantastic. Absolutely. Anytime. I love the I think anybody listening and watching would just love the heart to handle those in crisis with such care, with mm. such compassion. I can tell you, I know that man if we'd have done this work sooner in life, I have a number of clients who are in their twenties, every single one of them, I say it to them all the time. God, I wish I did this at your age. God, I wish right. I, I wish I did this at your age. And so, man, I'm, mm. I'm honored to have spent the last amount of time with you. So thank you for taking yeah. time out. To thank be you. With I feel honored too. Thank you, Sam. All right, brother.